Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. El Dorado is applied to a legendary New World story in which precious stones were found in fabulous abundance along with gold coins. The legend of the seven cities of gold became mixed with the stories of El Dorado, which was sometimes said to be one of the seven cities. Sir Walter Raleigh, of Roanoke fame, would later take up the search for the mythical kingdom. Before Sir Walter's attempt, Spanish conquistador Francisco Vasquez de Coronado led an expedition from Mexico through the southwestern USA in search of the fabled cities of Cibola in the 16th century. He had hoped to reach the continent's El Dorado, located throughout the pueblos of the New Mexico Territory. Let's listen to more about this famous North American expedition to the continent's El Dorado, generously presented by LibriVox. Coronado and the Seven Cities of Cibola The remarkable success of Cortes and Pizarro in Mexico and Peru went far to convince the Spaniards that in America they had found a veritable land of magic, filled with wonders and supremely rich in gold and gems. Ponce de Leon sought in Florida for the fabled Fountain of Youth, Hernando de Soto, one of the companions of Pizarro, attempted to find a second Peru in the north, and became the discoverer of the Mississippi. From Mexico other adventurers set out, with equal hopes, in search of empire and treasure. Some went south to the conquest of Central America, others north to California and New Mexico. The latter region was the seat of the fancied seven cities of Cibola, the search for which it is here proposed to describe. In 1538 Francisco Vasquez de Coronado was appointed governor of New Galicia, as the country lying north of Mexico was named, and sent out a certain Fray Marcos, a monk who had been with Pizarro in Peru, on a journey of exploration to the north. With him were some Indian guides and a black Mexican named Estevanico, or Stephen, who had been one of the survivors of the Narvaez expedition to Florida, and had traveled for years among the Indians of the north. He was expected to be of great assistance. As the worthy friar went on, he was told of rich regions beyond, where the people wore ornaments of gold, and at length he sent Stephen in advance to investigate the report. Stephen was to send back by the Indians a cross, the size of which would indicate the importance of what he had learned. Within four days, messengers returned with a great cross the height of a man, significant of great and important discoveries. One of the Indians told the friar that thirty days' journey from the point they had reached was a populous country called Cibola in which were seven great cities under one lord, peopled by a civilized nation that dwelt in large houses well built of stone and lime, some of them several stories in height. The entrances to the principal houses were richly wrought with turquoise, which was there in great abundance. Farther on, they had been told, were other provinces, each of them much greater than that of the seven cities. Two days after Easter, 1539, Fray Marcos set out on the track of his pioneer, eager to reach the land of wonders and riches of which he had been told. Doubtless there arose in his mind dreams of a second Mexico or Peru. The land through which lay his route was strange and picturesque. Here were fertile valleys watered by streams and walled in by mountains. There were narrow canyons through which ran rapid streams with rock walls hundreds of feet high and cut into strange forms of turrets and towers. As he went on, he heard more of the seven cities and the distant kingdoms, and of the abundance of turquoises with which the natives adorned their persons and their doorways. But nothing was seen of Stephen, though shelter and provisions were found which he had left at points along the route. As for the dusky pioneer, Fray Marcos was never to set eyes on him again. At length the good monk reached a fertile region, irrigated like a garden, where the men wore three or four strings of turquoises around their necks, and the women wore them in their ears and noses. But Sibola lay still beyond, the tales of the natives magnifying its houses till some of them were ten stories in height. Ladders, they said, were used in place of stairways. Reaching at length the Gila River, a stream flowing through deep and rugged valleys, he heard again of Stephen, who was crossing the wilderness to the northeast, escorted like a prince by some three hundred natives. Fifteen days' journey still lay between Fray Marcos and Cibola, and he went on into the wilderness, escorted like his pioneer by a large train of natives who volunteered their services. For twelve days the journey continued, through a rough mountain region, abundantly supplied with game, consisting of deer, rabbits, and partridges, which was brought in by the Indian hunters. But now there came back startling news, for one of the guides appeared, pallid with fright, telling how Stephen had reached Cibola, where he had been seized, plundered, and imprisoned. Farther on two more Indians were met, covered with blood and wounds, who said that they had escaped from the slaughter of all their comrades by the warlike people of Cibola. 
The bold monk had now much trouble in getting his frightened followers to go on with him, but by means of abundant presents he induced two of the chiefs to proceed. He was determined to gain at least a sight of the land of wonders, and with the chiefs and his own followers he cautiously proceeded. At length from a hill summit he looked down on a broad plain on which he saw the first of the famous seven cities. To his excited fancy it was greater than the city of Mexico, the houses of stone in many stories and with flat roofs. This was all he could tell from his distant view in which the mountain hazes seemed to have greatly magnified his power of vision. That was the end of Fray Marco's journey. He did not dare to approach nearer to that terrible people, and, as he quaintly says, returned with more fear than victuals, overtaking his escort, which moved by a still greater fear had not waited for him. Back to Coronado he went with his story, a disappointing one since he had seen nothing of either gold, silver, or precious stones, the nearest approach to treasure being the greenish turquoise. The story of Stephen, as afterwards learned, was one that might have fitted the Orient. He advanced with savage magnificence, bells and feathers adorning his sable arms and legs, while he carried a gourd decorated with bells and with white and red feathers. This he knew to be a symbol of authority among the Indians. Two Spanish greyhounds followed him, and a number of handsome Indian women, whom he had taken up on the way, attended him. He was followed with a large escort of Indians, carrying his provisions and other effects, among them gifts received or plunder taken from the natives. When near Cibola, he, in disobedience of the orders given him, sent messengers to the city bearing his gourd, and saying that he came to treat for peace and to cure the sick. The chief, to whom the gourd was presented, on observing the bells, cast it angrily to the ground, exclaiming, I know not these people, their bells are not of our fashion. Tell them to return at once, or not a man of them will be left alive. In despite of this hostile message, the vainglorious Stephen went on. He and his company were not permitted to enter the city, but were given a house outside of it, and here they were stripped of all their possessions and refused food and drink. The next morning they left the house, where they were quickly surrounded and attacked by a great number of the townspeople, all of them being killed except the two Indians who had brought the news to Fray Marcos. Why they were treated in this manner is not known. They seem to have been looked on as spies or enemies. But it is interesting that the legend of the killing of a black Mexican still lingers in a pueblo of the Zuni Indians, though three centuries and a half have since then elapsed. The story of the discovery of the seven cities, as told by the worthy Fray Marcos, when repeated in the city of Mexico, gave rise to high hopes of a new El Dorado, and numbers were ready to join in an expedition to explore and conquer Cibola. Francisco de Coronado was given the command. One of American poet Edgar Allan Poe's last poems was titled El Dorado. Like the subject of the poem, the author was on a quest for success or happiness. And, despite spending his life searching for it, he eventually loses his strength and faces death. In the 1966 John Wayne film, El Dorado, actor James Caan recites parts of the poem. Let's listen to this classic literary composition, first published in 1849. El Dorado by Edgar Allan Poe Gaily bedight a gallant knight in sunshine and in shadow, had journeyed long, singing a song in search of El Dorado. But he grew old this night so bold, and o'er his heart a shadow, fell as he found no spot of ground that looked like El Dorado. And as his strength failed him at length, he met a pilgrim shadow. Shadow, said he, where can it be? This land of El Dorado. Over the mountains of the moon, down the valley of the shadow, ride, boldly ride, the shade replied, if you seek for El Dorado. Join me next time as we pursue our search for the precious treasures of North America's El Dorado. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride.